Hi. This is my friend that she was talking about. Reeves told us the other day at rehearsals that we were supposed to be eccentric because we were at Caltech, so this is my friend. Um, I'm not really that eccentric. I was trying to be eccentric. So the other day, uh, a while back, I was at the grocery store, and uh, I was standing in line, and I had my young son with me, Noah. He's eight months old. And I had him in the front carrier. He was facing forward, because apparently he's very cute, and he starts conversations with people. And it's great, because I get all this attention, but it's, you know, you're talking to him. And the lady in front of me was talking about how rapidly both people and things change. And she said, she told the story of how when she was a girl, when she was about 10 years old, she realized that her mother, her mother's generation, had grown up without televisions. And she was shocked, and she was dismayed when she found this out. And she was kind of like, well, what did you do without televisions? <laughs> so she went one step further, and she said, when Noah is about 10 years old, he'll say to you, Dad, how did you ever get anything done without computers? Because when, when I was a child, I didn't have computers. And then it dawned on me, Noah's children, my grandchildren, will one day say to him, Dad, what was life like before robots? So that's not such an absurd goal anymore. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we have nanobots, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, we should really catch up, us roboticists, with people-sized robots. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do. And uh, so I want to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing here at Caltech over in the Chandler Cafeteria. You should go over there and uh, go stand by the pizza bar and look up. There's some cameras that monitor people. Um, and we've been working on robotic navigation in human crowds. So I want to do, I want to give a brief introduction to robotic navigation. So here we have a picture, of, uh, a picture from the overhead camera in Chandler in the student cafeteria. It's about 13 feet high. It's looking down at the floor. You can see at the top of the frame uh, the pizza bar. And at the bottom, you can see <coughs> The buffet bar, circled in green, is my friend, this guy. And he's supposed to go to the yellow and then the red. And you can see there's some obstacles in the way. So let's see how he does. All right, he finds his way in there, thinks about it. He's got to get over the red, remember. And he finds his way out. So the takeaway message of this is that navigating robots, today's navigating robots, have wheels and they have motors inside this big box and they have computers and they have sensors and they have wireless communication ports. And importantly, they have software that can detect obstacles. And they have software that can also take those obstacles that they've just detected and plan around those obstacles to their goals. But this is pretty old technology. Let's talk about Wally, -E. <laughs> Service robots. That's what I want to build someday. Unfortunately, I can't build him yet, so he's just going to be the mascot for my talk today. And the reason he's going to be the mascot is because he's really good at doing two of the things uh, that I think are, are, are real challenges to robotic navigation. So let's finish our, our brief introduction to robotic navigation in human crowds. So this time, we have the same task. The robot needs to go from green to yellow to red, except there's people. And these people don't know anything about the robot. They just went to lunch. They're just Caltech students, so they're eccentric, and they went to lunch. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, so they, you know, so they were, we'll sort of caveat that with how they behave around the robot. So the robot needs to find his way around all these people and do its task. So there he goes. It's a good little move. He's going, he missed that guy. Bam, he did it. Wow, that was really good. Unfortunately, I was over in the corner with a joystick controlling him. <laughs> so this brings us to the state of the art of robotic navigation. They can't, our robots today can't actually do that. And that's what we're working on. That's what we want to do. So we have two big challenges I want to talk about. And the first one is, what does successful crowd navigation even mean for a robot? So let's lean on our Wally -E metaphor, right? If we think back to the movie, Wally -E and humans, they integrated seamlessly. They blended when they worked around in crowds together. It was like Wally -E was just another person. They didn't even think about it. He didn't even, you know, it was just natural for him. So we'd like to do that. It turns out there's, there's some nice theory indicating that we, if we can build human crowd models, human crowd behavior models, we can export that to robotic navigation algorithms so that the robot kind of behaves like a person. But that begs the question of how do we build ro uh, human behavior models. So let's look at some data, like you know, Richard Feynman would do. So here we have this person. She's moving around the cafeteria. I'm just going to let you watch. So, so the color coding there, the red was collision avoidance. I meant to tell you before I hit the button. 
Um, and the green was goal-oriented behavior, and the blue is normal movement. Now, that looks like such a chaotic trajectory. Can we really build models that can predict that? Well, the answer is that human crowd navigation is sort of like the weather. We do forecasting. It's sort of fundamentally inaccurate. But in places like cafeterias, we have goals. And those goals can really constrain our predictions. And we can do actually quite well. And with those crowd models, with those human models, we can make our robots do pretty good. So my final problem is how do we get the humans to play fair? So in this video, we see a robotic tour guide from the late 90s. And he's going to get clobbered by some curious children. <laughs> you got to be really careful when you're designing your rob robot, or else they will get clobbered. So how do we do that? Well, there's a few, there's a few approaches. Um, the first one is appearance. People like, people like to see robots that's, that they think can see them. So this guy has three eyes, and that's kind of weird. But he has a computer, but it all indicates to the person that, that this robot knows he's there and is probably thinking about him. But appearance is not the whole story. In fact, behavior and movement is much more important, especially in crowds. So like we saw in the movie earlier when I was controlling the robot, people just moved around him. They cooperated with him. And that's the key insight is that if our robots move like people, then they get treated like people, they, they get cooperated with. If they behave like toys, like this guy, and they sort of dawdle around, don't do anything, then people hit them. They, they don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it goes. Um, so the, the, po the point is, is that we have this really interesting thing. We have this robot that's completely mechanical. And in order to make it work with humans, we have to better understand humans. So I'll finish with a quote. At bottom, Robotics is about us. It is the discipline of emulating our lives and of wondering how we work. Thank you very much.